Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So, last summer I did a load of courses, eBay related courses, on a site called Skillshare. And now I've decided to migrate those courses over from that website to YouTube. So there's going to be loads of different beginner courses that are going to be coming over here uh, for you guys to view on this YouTube channel. So with that being said, the next video you're going to, uh, going to see is obviously one of those courses. Um, so yeah. Hope you enjoy. Hi there Skillshare and welcome to another video class. So today I've got quite an exciting class for you and um, we're going to be doing an eBay survival guide. So essentially the person who would like to take this class or the perfect candidate for this class I believe is someone who has basic eBay experience. So maybe if you have never been on eBay before this course might not quite be for you. However if you have a few weeks experience with eBay, if you've maybe listed a couple of items before if you know how to nav navigate the site and you know how to buy things on there and you know a little bit of basic information of how to sell things on there, then this is going to be a good class for you. So with that being said, what are we going to actually be learning in this class? Obviously, it's an eBay survival guide, but what are we going to be touching on? Well, essentially, we're going to be talking about things like the eBay defect system. We're going to be talking about what you can and what you can't sell on eBay. We're going to be talking about things like communicating with buyers effectively. We're going to be talking about a few of the good practices on eBay that you may want to employ to obviously have a good experience experience on the platform. So with all that being said, if that sounds like a good course that you really want to um, obviously get involved with and you feel like that will take your eBay knowledge to the next level, then please do stick around and I will see you in the next segment. So I wanted to talk a little bit first off about some good practices when you're selling on eBay. So first off, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the obviously the listing process because that is going to be the bulk of where we need to be doing these good practices. So essentially, first off, starting with the title, obviously if you're on a listing page on eBay, you will first input the title. Generally, a good practice is to put as much information in there as possible. Now, not only does this serve the purpose of obviously um, get relating to your customer um, or communicating to your customer what the item actually is in a clear way, but also using all the characters in the title will have an impact on the search ranking of your item. So you obviously uh, put a load of different keywords in that title, then you're going to be popping up for various different searches and you may even obviously jump a few rankings in the search. So um, it's always a good idea to pack that title out, making sure that your buyers can clearly understand what the item is and you can also um, take an advantage in the search engine as well on eBay. So Obviously, a good practice is to fill your title out. Now, next, we want to specify the condition, obviously, making sure, and here's a very, very good practice that some people don't actually do, and this can get them into trouble with eBay. Uh, generally, some people might put used when an item has been untested. Now, that can actually get you into some serious trouble with eBay if someone were to report your, your listing, because if you've, un if you've got an item that is untested, but you may not have the facility to test it, and then you're putting that as used condition. A used item is one that is obviously in pre-owned condition, but generally that is still in working order. So if you have an item that's untested, be sure to use that drop-down menu and select, I believe it's the four parts or four spares or repairs or whatever it is, uh, select that um, option because then that will obviously cover you in that circumstance. And also, if a buyer gets the item expecting it to work, obviously you've selected use condition and they expect it to work, and then obviously it doesn't work, they may have a good solid uh, case for a dispute there as well, and it can just get you into uh, problems and issues that could have been avoided really. So essentially make sure that you are speci specifying the condition correctly. Obviously if the item um, is brand new and sealed but it has a lot of wear to the package or it's got dents in the package, maybe specify that as like new or maybe used again just to avoid any um, you know further issues down the line. Now we come on to what I would argue is the most important part of the listing which is the photography. Now you can see here I'm doing this course on a green screen 
screen, I've got I've actually got two lights beside me and I've got one light up there. And this green screen isn't 100% properly lit. You can probably see around my hat here, there's slight little bits of graininess. So obviously, even with all this light on my green screen, it still isn't properly lit. So if we apply that to obviously a photo area, it just shows that we need plenty of lighting on that photo area. Maybe not as much as a green screen, but certainly we do need plenty of light on that photo area to make sure that we can really get our items standing out. And also we want some contrast between the, the colour of the photo area and the colour of the item. So what do I mean by this? Essentially, if you've got a black item, then a white photo area might be great. Or if you've got a blue item or a green item or a red item, whatever it is, a white photo area with plenty of lighting will really make that item stand out. But if you've got something like glassware, if you sell glasses on eBay, so maybe you know beer glasses or, or, or pint pots or whatever it is, um, then obviously a white background might not make those items stand out that well. Obviously, even if you've got a lot of lighting on it, it might be quite glary from the glass, obviously from the light reflecting off the glass. And obviously you might not even be able to see the item that well. So in other circumstances like that, you may want to opt for a black background. Now, obviously some people may say, change your photo area out. So for example, have a black photo area um, that you can change out for a white one or a white photo area that you can change out for a black one. So that's always an option. Um, but ultimately, if you're maybe just selling items that uh, you know, 99% of your items do really uh, well on a white uh, background, then maybe just have a white background. Um, but it is important to make sure that your photos are really, really well lit. Now, of course, if you've got any flaws on your item or if you've got a mark on your item that maybe you've tried cleaning off but it won't come off, then you do need to make sure to clearly do a photo of that and highlight that in the photos, obviously. So also, as well as that, uh, once we've done those photos, we want to then reiterate any flaws or any marks or anything within the description as well as I mentioned before about you know if your item is untested making sure that that's reiterated in the description as well now as uh, just moving back to photos for a second um, when we have obviously have the photos we have the option on eBay to adjust the brightness or maybe you can adjust the brightness in, in places like Photoshop and stuff like that and maybe you could adjust the uh, um, you know saturation and stuff in Photoshop I would actually err on the side of caution with doing that because what you're essentially doing when you're adjusting the brightness or when you're adjusting the saturation of a photo is you're distorting the color of the image slightly and then obviously that doesn't bring the best um, honesty within your photos and then when a buyer actually receives the item and maybe you've color corrected it a little bit and it looks a little bit different than the actual original item they may have a case for some sort of dispute there and that again just creates another issue further down the line so make sure when you're doing your photos to obviously if you color correct them or anything, be very, very, very careful with doing so. Um, also, I just wanted to very quickly touch on when, and, and when we move on to description as well. That, sorry, then we'll move on to description. Um, so I wanted to actually touch on the amount of photos you should do. Obviously, you can do 12 photos, up to 12 photos for free. Now, does this mean you should do 12 photos? Well, in my personal opinion, no, it doesn't. For example, and I'll, and I'll explain this, um, if you've got an item like a Lego minifigure, can you really do 12 photos on a Lego minifigure? Well, obviously you can do. Obviously, it's not a physical impossibility to, to do not do 12 photos on a Lego minifigure. But is it really needed? It, in my opinion, it's not needed. Maybe three or four photos maximum are needed for a Lego minifigure. But something that is a higher value item, maybe you've got it on for £100 or $100 or $200 or whatever it is, and um, then, you know, and it's maybe a bit of a complex item, maybe it's um, a video games console or something like that, or maybe it's some sort of, um, uh, you know, I don't know, some sort of computer or something that does need a lot of photos, actually, then obviously using the 12 photos, go straight ahead, do that, make sure that you're covering every angle, make sure you're covering every floor 
on that on that item as well so obviously yeah you can do the 12 photos but you don't have to I have heard um, you know a few sellers mention that it may actually help in search ranking if you do include the full 12 photos but I generally just go off a, a standard of maybe five six or seven photos in a listing uh, you know in any given listing because generally that's what my uh, when, you know when I'm rotating the item when I'm doing all my photos that's generally what it comes out at and I don't feel like I need to do any more after that but generally making sure that your photos speak and that they are um, very professional that will all help you know you don't necessarily need to do loads of photos but make sure you've got quality photos so moving on to the description very quickly and then we will move on to the next segment so Essentially, with the description, just making sure that you've provided any information on flaws, uh, whether it's untested, whether it's uh, you know got a mark on it or anything like I mentioned, just duplicating that information from the photo uh, down to the description. So if you've got a, a photo with a flaw on, making sure that you're just um, highlighting that in the description as well. So buyers are fully aware of what they're getting. So again, it doesn't create any issues further down the line. But also just putting things in there like... Um, you know, if it's in good condition, putting a little bit of information about that in there, maybe putting the age of an item in the description, or maybe putting, um, I don't know, any, any maybe, maybe the item is an antique and it has a little bit of a story behind it, maybe even putting a little bit of a small paragraph in there about the story, you could do that, I'm not saying it's necessary, sometimes I don't put that much information in my description, other times I do put a little bit of information in the description. It really depends on the item with the description. If it's a brand new item that's completely brand new, you know, there's no flaws on the item or anything, then you don't need to do hardly any of the description, in my personal opinion. If it's an item that's maybe a little bit more intricate, maybe it's been tested, but there's maybe a couple of flaws with the item, you might need to write a little bit of a section, a little bit of a paragraph or so on that just to totally explaining the flaw with the item or what the item is and you know what's been tested on the item and what's working and what's not so essentially we'll leave it there for obviously best practices when you're listing on eBay doing all that stuff in conjunction with each other will really help sell your items not only will it really help sell your items but it will help avoid any issues in the future and also it will actually help avoid negative feedback and obviously just negative customer experiences in general. So I will leave it there and I will see you in the next segment. So in this segment, we are now on the computer, as you can probably see, and we're gonna go through a few of the banned items on eBay. Now it's important to state that this is gonna be for the UK. So obviously if you are in the US or if you're in Australia or France or Germany or wherever it is, this may be slightly different. Now I do know that between the UK and the US, there is a lot of overlap on these items but also there are going to be discrepancies there are going to be differences between the items as well so you're going to have to make sure that you do do your own research if you are watching this from the US or from uh, Australia or whatever but essentially if you like obviously I've just typed in Google here eBay UK banned items if you just type this um type in here eBay USA banned items there should be a page I, I believe it should be this page here I think it is let's just click into it um, and then obviously yeah this is the US page so this will then give you um, an idea of the US prohibited and restricted items but let's just go back a minute and uh, let's go on the UK one because uh, obviously I'm from the UK I'm, I live in England so I'm just doing this on the UK here so essentially we've got prohibited and restricted items now the um, sort of the penalties for um, actually listing a restricted or prohibited or banned item on eBay is actually um, a firm warning on an email for maybe your first time but also for a second time or a third time you may well get an eBay ban now this is a temporary ban normally it's just a temporary ban from listing and it can be in the uh, ranges of three day ban seven day ban 10 day ban or 30 day ban now if you get a certain number of bans now there isn't any set number of bans um but if you get a certain number of bans or 
a certain number of items that you're listing on eBay um, and you're actually breaking the rules regularly, you will get your account suspended and usually, or a lot of the time, there is no appeal for this, okay? So make sure that you are doing plenty of research yourself and make sure that you're obviously looking at what items aren't okay to list on eBay and what are, so that then you're making sure that you're protecting your eBay account and you are actually surviving on eBay. So essentially here we've got uh, prohibited and restricted items. This is just the overview. So you can obviously um, see here we've got understanding the rules. Here are some basic things to keep in mind when listing your items on eBay. Our policies are often based on country and state laws, although in some cases they may be based on input from our members and our own discretion, especially for dangerous or sensitive items, for example, see our offensive material policy. So it says here, be sure to read our policies before listing items, follow our guidelines and review our examples so you know beforehand what you can and can't sell on eBay. So, uh, and it also says, note that examples aren't, are not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Now, I will give you a very big tip that I got told by an eBay representative. So, essentially, he told me with, um, obviously, understanding these rules and, obviously, listing prohibited items or feeling like you're going to be listing a prohibited item, what you can do is you can snap a photo of the item in question and before you list it you can go on the eBay live chat and you can actually show them and you or you can um, essentially send them a photo in an email if you can't actually send them a photo in the live chat you can send them a photo and you can ask them look is this a prohibited item am I okay to list this on eBay so if you're really genuinely worried about an item please do that before you list your item because obviously that may save you from a ban or save you from an account suspension or anything like that. So just be very careful when you're doing these things. But as I say, there are different ways to be able to, um, you know, prevent these bans and prevent pre prevent account suspensions and stuff. It's just about following the rules. That's all it's about with a lot of things. So essentially i'm not just going to go through all these but um the, the list of prohibited and restricted items below covers things that can be listed under certain conditions and things that can't be listed at all so i'm just going to quickly look at a few of these so the prohibited items you cannot list these are items you can't list at all on ebay and you can see there's a little bit of a list down here and you can click into all of these so we've got adults only which is Obviously, things like um, a little bit naughty things, um, sort of bondage toys and stuff like that. I won't go into too much detail in that, but you kind of get my drift on that. And uh, they, it does. If I click into it here, I think it does say um, that you can list them in certain circumstances, which is quite odd. Because here we go. So, se sexual wellness category. Um, only permitted biz own, so only permitted business sellers can sell them in um, they need to actually um, put them in these certain categories so yeah I would be very very careful with this um, and obviously it does say only permitted business sellers so just be careful with that but I don't think it's going to be something you'd be selling anyway uh, drugs and drug paraphernalia so be careful with that just don't go near them uh, generally I, I stay away from any medicine and stuff like that be very very careful with that stuff um, We've got lock picking devices down here, so obviously eBay don't want to encourage um, theft and stuff like that, so they have banned lock picking devices. Firearms, weapons and knives, I'm going to click into this because this is very important. Um, so essentially what we've got is, let's just go into knives here. So what are, this gives you, with these drop down menus, you can click into any one of these and it gives you an idea of what you can list and what you can't list. So we've got allowed here. Dining cutlery sets that includes, includes knives used for eating, letter openers, razor blades and surgical blades, tools such as chisels, axes, saws and hoof trimming tools. And then not allowed, we've got pocket knives, multi-tool knives, push daggers, um, we've got sharp kitchen knives as in pear blocks, uh, cake knives, carving knives, pairing knives, oyster knives, etc. So you can actually go into each one of these and do the drop down menus and you can actually see exactly what you can't sell and what you can sell. Um, so it looks like firearms are pretty much all restricted or most of them are restricted. 
Got bulletproof vests slash flank jackets that are allowed. Magazine holders, moon clips, etc. are allowed. But then we've got restricted and then not allowed as well. So you've got to be very, very careful with some of these things. So they're like, the really, these items may not be listed on eBay. So these are, the prohibited items are very, you've got to be very, very careful with these. The restricted items are a little bit more lenient. So for example, We've got clothing that's used, so obviously you can list used clothing, that's not an issue. But it does say here, used clothing except for underwear and socks can be listed on eBay as long as it has been cleaned according to the manufacturer's instructions. So obviously, if you're buying things from charity shops, generally charity shops will clean the items beforehand anyway, or they will at least steam them. Um, so generally, you should be okay with that anyway, but certainly um, in some circumstances, you're best to clean them as well. Um, and it says it's stain free and does not include adult or inappropriate content within the listing. So again, be careful with how you're photographing them. Um, obviously, you do see on, on eBay a few listings with people modeling their own clothing which is fine but obviously it depends in what way you're modeling the clothing obviously it says um you know if there's inappropriate content within the listing if you're modeling it in a sexually suggestive way or anything like that that might not be a good idea to do so just be very careful so again we can just click in and out of all of these but generally what i would suggest you do is you look down these listings and you think to yourself what am i going to be selling what am i going to be selling on a regular basis um, and does any of those any of those items relate to any of these here? So, for example, let's say you might be thinking of selling um, cosmetics. You might be thinking of selling used cosmetics. So you want to click in that, and then you want to read through the entirety of this just to get more um, more well versed in this actual category. I mean, I would as I would advise going through all of this, you know, going into each one and reading all of them, but it's not necessarily completely 100% necessary if you're not going to be touching certain items. Like, for example, I know myself that I'm not going to be touching lock picking devices or adult toys or anything like that. I'm never going to be touching anything like that, so I don't need them. But the things like firearms and weapons, as you saw before, uh, dining cutlery is allowed on eBay. Now, I sell dining cutlery on eBay, so I need to be aware of that policy because if that policy changes, then I uh, I might get bans or I might get restrictions. So you've got to be careful um, with certain ones. But certainly look down the list and make sure that what you're selling is okay. And before you even list it, really, just make sure it's okay. I can't stress that in enough. Just make sure that obviously you're, you're reading some of these. We've got potential infringing down here. These items may infringe certain copyright or trademarks. So we've got... Uh, copyright, we've got bootleg recordings, things like that. Be very, very careful. I wouldn't sell anything like this. Um, authenticity disclaimer and stuff, you've got to be... And then rules about intellectual property. So be very, very careful with selling things like that. And then, obviously, some people will be uh, reporting these policies. It says here, I'll just read this out quickly. Reporting policy breaches. If you see a listing that breaches eBay policies, please report it by clicking the report item link in the, in the listing or by clicking the report link or contact us button located on most of our help pages. When a policy breach occurs, we email the seller and the bidders or buyer to let them know that the listing has been removed from eBay. So be very careful because if you've got an, an item that's live that is actually breaching eBay policy and then it gets reported, they will then remove that item and in some cases um, they will give you a, they will give the seller a ban as well. So be very, very careful with what you're listing because other sellers or maybe other buyers may be going around. There are people on eBay that go around just reporting listings because um, I don't know, maybe we don't have anything better to do, but um, they do go around reporting listings and like sort of cleaning up eBay if you like. So um be very careful with, with what you're listing. So essentially that's that. As I say, it might be good just to go through all these items. I'm not going to be reading through all these with you today. It would be a 12-hour course or something, obviously going into each one of these and reading the entire page. Just go through yourself. Obviously, you can come onto this page. I'll just go back again. Uh, oh, no, actually, I can't go. Let me... Oh, yeah, there we go. That's it. Right, let's go back again here. 
Uh, right, so if you just click, type in uh, eBay UK banned items and then it should be the top result and then you can obviously go into that in more detail. So I will leave it there. Make sure that you are being very, very careful with what you're listing on eBay. Um, eBay bans are probably the biggest cause of account suspensions and people you know, not being able to go on eBay again as a seller. Be very, very careful of what you are listing. I've heard some um, pretty bad horror stories of people um, actually getting chucked off eBay. I mean, there's people who are doing £50,000, £100,000 in sales a year and they've just got chucked off eBay straight away for a ban. Um, and eBay really don't care about the numbers they're doing. They don't care about the livelihood of the person. They will just throw you off because you're not playing by the rules so be very very careful anyway i'll leave this segment here guys i hope you enjoyed this little segment and i will see you in the next one so in this segment we're going to be explaining ebay defects now these come in three separate categories so what i'm going to do is go through them one by one and what i'm going to do is start off with the first one which is probably the easiest to understand which is the ebay late delivery defect now essentially when you list an item on ebay you uh, obviously get told that you need to select a dispatch time and this will usually be one working day two working day three working day etc so for example what you're doing in that circumstance circumstances you're telling eBay let's say that you choose the two working day option you're telling eBay that you're going to dispatch that within two working days so you're going to package it and you're going to post it within two working days now let's say that you don't actually hit that on one occasion and you actually um, you miscalculate or you make a mistake or something comes along that hinders you uh, with your time or whatever and you don't get that item out for four working days, then that's gonna to get to the customer late. And then essentially what the customer may do is go onto the feedback form, obviously um, specify, it has a little question at the bottom of the feedback form, did this item arrive on this date? Or did it arrive after it or whatever whatever the question is I can't quite remember what the question is specifically but it's something like that and then if they click no and then they submit that form then what that what that's going to do is notify eBay that your parcel was late and then they are going to give you a late delivery defect now you might be thinking at this point where do I find out how um, uh, you know what defects I've got what percentage of defects I've got what my seller level is all that sort of stuff well, where you can find this information out is in the account section and then under the seller standards dashboard. And then it has a little drop down menu that you can see the percentage of your defects. Um, and also it shows you your seller level, which could be eBay top rated. It could be um, it could be something like uh, above standard or below standard. So essentially that's where you can find out this information. And the late delivery defect is separate to the other two defects that I will be talking about in a minute. Now, if you get over a 3% late delivery defect, so 3% of your transactions in any given period, um, uh, you know, over 3% of your transactions in any given period have uh, obviously succumbed to the late delivery, then that will drop you um, from top rated to obviously above standard. But 3% is quite a generous margin and you shouldn't really be, obviously if you've got a hundred, if you're selling a hundred items in a month, really you shouldn't be um, having any problems in obviously keeping below three items as a late delivery uh, generally if you're you know if you get quite timely with your parcels if you do this as your full-time job and you are quite you know you're, you're obviously making sure that you are on it with dispatching the items then it shouldn't be a problem to keep to that uh, and I think mine is about 0.61% late delivery so it's quite you know it's quite easy to keep to that so that one isn't too bad. Just make sure that, you know, let's say that you um, aren't particularly great with your time management or let's say that you have a lot of parcels to go out or something, then, you know, your, your parcels are increasing, your sales are increasing. Maybe just set that dispatch time a little bit later to give yourself a little bit more breathing room to get those items out if you feel like you aren't going to actually hit that timing. So maybe you're on, you were on one working day dispatch, but maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I've got a lot of parcels to go out or, or you know, I've uh, my sales are starting to increase. So maybe I, I should actually increase that to two working days or three working days just to give you a bit of breathing room. So then you can avoid those late delivery defects. So that's actually one way that you can actually avoid the late delivery. But obviously increasing your 
dispatch time will obviously mean that the customers are getting the item um, you know further and further away so for example if you have a free working day dispatch time and you obviously dispatch on a third working day opposed to having a one day dispatch the customer would be getting it a lot sooner with a one working day dispatch so it might put a few customers off buying your items opposed to buying someone else's items so um, you know who maybe has a um, quicker dispatch time so you've got to factor that in as well but essentially that is the late delivery defect and as I say you can sell that, you can uh, find that in your um, seller standards dashboard. So essentially the next two are linked in some way. So this is uh, set cases uh, closed without seller resolution is one of them and then the uh, out of stock defect as well. So let's talk about the out of stock defect. and. Well, just before we talk about that, essentially what we've got now is a 0.5% uh, margin for essentially a defect. So, for example, between these two different defects, you're allowed 0.5% of your transactions in any given period to have a defect. If you go over that 0.5% in a defect rate, then what you're going to get is you're going to go below top uh, top rates. Uh, sorry, you're going to go from top rated to seller to above standard, and then depending on how big a percentage of defects you've got, you may go down to below standard as well. And then you really do have to be careful because you may be at risk of eBay obviously shutting down your account or taking further action against your account because you are below standard. So. Let's not. I don't want to try and scare you with this information. I'm just trying to give you this information in, in the most factual way I can. Um, they're not. It's not scary if you do all the correct, um, you know, procedures with eBay. It doesn't have to be scary or anything like that. So essentially, we've got the out of stock defect. So let's say I've sold an item on eBay. And I thought I've had that item in stock and I go to my storage area and I'm looking everywhere for all my storage area, you know, I'm going through boxes and bins, etc. I'm going through ev everything and I can't seem to find that one item. Then essentially what I may have to do is click on cancel the sale on eBay and then click on the uh, options. It says select a reason for cancelling this order and click on the out of stock option. And when you do that, when you actually cancel that order, then essentially it will give you a defect for being out of stock because essentially you're letting the customer down. They thought they were getting this item and you, you've not got it for whatever reason. You can't find it and essentially letting the customer down so therefore you get a defect for that. Now obviously the defect percentage will um, fluctuate because it depends on how many transactions you have. So if you have a lot of transactions then that defect percentage will be very very low and that actually works in your favour because obviously if, it's, if you've got a lot of transactions that defect percentage might only go up by 0.05% and then obviously we've got a long way to go to the 0.5% that would obviously demote you from top rated to above standard. So obviously having a lot of transactions can actually work in your favour but also if you have more transactions you've got more risk of having uh, you know of getting more defects maybe more risk of being out of stock or more risk of uh, of getting a um, case closed without seller resolution defects so obviously you've got to make sure that um, you know you're you're, you're following these uh, you're following things to the letter and making sure that you're not needing to um, select that reason of going out of stock and getting that defect so um, essentially the next um, defect is as I mentioned case closed without seller resolution this can actually be um, pretty much controlled by you completely so you don't need to worry too much about this however if you do get one of these defects these are quite powerful defects and they can actually increase your uh, defect rate by quite a lot I actually got one of these and I think I was at about uh, 0.25 or something and it shot me up to 0.51 and I nearly went uh, below I nearly went from top rated seller to above standard however I rang eBay and I told them the situation it was actually a situation where I was actually getting scammed and I told them the uh, situation and they were kind enough to actually remove the defect so I didn't actually go uh, below top rated which was brilliant um, but essentially this is where, for example, you have a return request, right? You have a return request and um, essentially what will happen is um, eBay nowadays generally auto accepts return requests for you. But let's say the item gets returned to you 
and then obviously on eBay, eBay will say uh, this item has now been delivered because obviously it's sent uh, with tracking. So eBay will already know when it's been delivered. So they'll say this item has been delivered. Please provide a refund within the next eight days or 10 days or 12 days or whatever. And then what will happen is you will need to uh, provide a refund in that time. Now, if for whatever reason, maybe you're on holiday, whatever it is, maybe you're, you're, you're ill for some reason, you're, you're long-term ill, you know, you're ill for a couple of weeks or whatever, and you can't provide that refund, after those 12 days, what eBay will do is they will obviously give you a uh, case closed without seller resolution defect. They may give you a little bit more lenience, but generally they will just probably close the case and um, obviously give you a, um, a defect in that way. So basically this is completely in your control because all you have to do is make sure that you are refunding people on that set, you know, the, the set time that you need to be refunding people essentially. So uh, essentially it is pretty much in your control. Now also, I'm not 100% sure whether you can get a defect for in this specific defect for um, an item not received case, but I am betting uh, about 90% that you will. So for example, if a customer opens a case um, with an item not received, so an item not received case where they've just claiming that they've not received the item and then you obviously don't reply to that or you don't refund them or whatever, then after a certain amount of time they are probably going to give you a, a, a case closed without seller resolution as well because that in itself, uh, an item not received, is still a, a case as well. It's still known as an eBay case. So yeah, I would imagine that you've got to be um, pretty careful with that as well. But I don't generally um, worry too much about this because I'm so on the ball with with uh, return requests and item not as received. Um, I don't need to actually worry about this information too much because I, I, I just, I do the things that eBay require me to do anyway. So it's not too much of a worry or any, anything like that for me. So essentially what we've got is we've got late delivery. So making sure that you're obviously um, dispatching your items on time to avoid the late delivery. The out of stock defect, essentially the way you can avoid that is making sure that you're, you're doing maybe regular inventory checks so that you can obviously make sure that there's nothing on your inventory, that there's, there's nothing live on eBay that you haven't got in your possession, and then obviously you won't get a, an out of stock delivery defect, uh, sorry, an out of stock defect even. Um, and then obviously the case closed without cell uh, resolution defect, you just need to be on the ball with your cases, you need to be responding to people, you need to be, need to be communicating with customers effectively and giving refunds or you know par partial refunds or whatever it is, whatever it may be, uh, uh, you need to be uh, doing the actions very, very quickly and, it, you know, in a timely manner. So essentially that's defects. It is quite a big subject, but once you understand it, once you actually go into your seller uh, standards dashboard and you can see it a little bit more, I mean, I will try and put a few graphics on uh, on this screen next to me, but once you see it a little bit more, once you get a bit more used to it, you will get a feel for it, but it's just going to take a little bit of time for you to actually really understand it even with the best explanation in the world, it, you, you are going to have to just uh, get a feel for it yourself over a little bit of time. But anyway, I will leave this segment here and we will go on to the next one. So in this segment, we're going to be talking about eBay feedback. So essentially, eBay feedback is just a rating system that customers use um, to obviously rate an experience with a seller. And obviously, we have positive feedback, neutral or negative. And uh, obviously, then you get a feedback score based on the amount of positive feedback in relation to the amount of negative feedback. So for example, my feedback score is about 2,700 or something. And obviously, that is 100% positive so I'm really really happy with that however um, for example let's say you get one negative in there then it might go down to 99.8 percent or 99.9 percent .9 positive feedback so essentially we obviously want to stay around that sort of 99 percent level we don't really want to dip below sort of 99 percent maybe you know 90 98 percent is not is still pretty good but you know we really I like to stay around that you know 99 percent if not a hundred percent if I can just stay at a hundred percent but essentially, when we're doing this, how do we actually make sure that buyers are going to be leaving positive feedback? Well, you might be thinking it's kind of out of our control somewhat because obviously a buyer 
it's their it's their choice whatever they leave if they leave negative or positive but it isn't completely out of our control obviously because we determine the experience that the buyer receives so essentially if we use the best practices that i out outlined earlier on in an earlier segment essentially if we are presenting the item on the listing and on the eBay platform as honestly and as professionally as we can. So we have professional title, professional uh, description, professional photos, and we really, really describe the item honestly. We highlight any flaws in the item. We highlight whether it's been untested or wh whether it's been tested or whether it's untested. We highlight everything about the item and we're very, very open and honest. We have professional photos and everything is looking good and obviously the customer knows exactly what they're getting, then obviously when they receive the item, there's no, not going to be any surprises, there's not going to be any negative surprises or positive, well, there's probably going to be some positive surprises, but there's not going to be any negative surprises to obviously make them feel like they've had a negative experience. So then they're obviously going to go through and, uh, you know, obviously leave you positive feedback. Now, in the case of some feedback, you can actually get it removed. So, for example, let's just say you've sold an item and you've obviously got a negative feedback. There are some circumstances where you can get it removed. For example, if you've stated an item that you're selling for spares or repairs or for parts or not working and uh, you obviously, um, a, a buyer buys it knowing that and then they receive it and they say, this item is not working um, then, and then they leave a feedback, uh, this item is not working, I wasn't made aware of this or whatever, you can then contact eBay and say, look, I was selling this as four parts not working, They've claimed that it's not working, but I was selling it as such. So then, obviously, you can get it removed. And that's actually happened to me, believe it or not. Uh, a customer did actually uh, send me a negative feedback based on that. I obviously then got it removed, no trouble from eBay, because I stated it wasn't working anyway, or it was four parts. Um, so essentially, in that situation, you can get it removed. Now, also, if a feedback has a personal attack in it, or if it has any profanity, you know, bad language, anything like that, you can also get that removed, no trouble. And in some circumstances, eBay will actually automatically remove that feedback straight away anyway, so you may not even see it. So obviously, uh, that's obviously one to look out for. If you've got a feedback and for some reason it hasn't been removed automatically and it says, you know, it's got a, ba a bad word in there, some profanity or whatever, then obviously you can get that removed, no trouble. You, you don't need to ring up eBay or anything you can just click I believe it's the um, uh, submit a revision request I think it is you can click that you can go through and you can get it removed pretty much instantly on eBay itself without having to ring up customer service or anything so yeah there are ways of getting uh, negative feedback removed but to be honest you shouldn't really need to go down that route anyway if you are providing a, a brilliant service and if you are providing obviously the good practices if you're doing the good practices that I mentioned in a, a different segment so with that being said I'll leave this segment here just make sure that you are providing that good, valuable service. And when you obviously get a negative feedback, sometimes you may have to just take it on the chin. But as you as you build up feedback and as you obviously sell more and more and more, that one negative feedback will get knocked further and further down the list. And obviously after 12 months, it gets erased anyway. So obviously throughout the passage of time, it won't mean a lot anyway to you. So anyway, I'll leave that segment here and we will get on with the next one. So hopefully in this class you'll have learned a few of the different ways to avoid issues and to obviously survive on eBay as well as to thrive as a good seller and really make your mark on the platform and obviously serve your customers well and ultimately get some money and some profit for yourself. So what I wanted to finally uh, touch on is messages and communicating with your buyers. I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes on this subject. It's not a huge subject but I do feel like it needs uh, touching on at the end of this class so essentially obviously eBay would like you to be professional in your messages with your customers now 98-99% of customers will be more than accommodating whether you've made made a mistake or whether they've made a mistake or whatever they will be more than accommodating through the messaging system and they will be very very friendly and very nice with you however there are the one or two percent that may uh, maybe it's as I say maybe it's a mistake at your end or maybe it's a um, 
you know, something that they've got wrong at their end, but they maybe don't want to admit it necessarily. Um, they may be quite assertive or aggressive on the messaging system. I can't express enough that you need to make sure that you are still being professional within the messages because eBay monitors the messages for things like policy breaches, things like obviously profanity and bad language and all the rest of it and these can all be taken into account against you if that buyer were to obviously open a case up against you or even if they weren't to open a case up against you, eBay could obviously just monitor that if you've breached their policy on the message and then they they could obviously give you a defect or something similar, maybe an eBay ban, etc. So be very careful when you are obviously messaging buyers. Now also, it's important to state that you're not allowed to send address information or contact a contact number through the eBay messaging system. You are allowed to in the case of once the buyer has hit the buy it now button and maybe it's a uh, you know a local collection and they obviously need a contact number or an address to actually get to you to get to the item. So you are allowed in certain circumstances but be very, very careful when you are sending address information or a, con a contact number through the eBay messages. It might do more bad than good. So just be very careful on that. But essentially, if you've got a buyer that is being quite assertive or quite aggressive, you need to rein it in a little bit and you need to make, calm yourself down a little bit before you send that message off. And once you send that message off, make sure that you are being professional in the message and that will hopefully diffuse a little bit of the ten tension between you and the buyer, whether it's been your mistake or whether it's a misconception at their end. Hopefully it will diffuse that a little bit. Now there is a chance that it won't diffuse it and you may every now and then, once in a blue moon, get a customer that is very, very stubborn um, or maybe just that is misdirected or whatever it is and they will just totally argue and argue and argue with you. Now, what you do at this point is dependent on the situation. Obviously, depends what they're arguing. So, for example, they may be arguing to get a partial refund or they may be arguing to... Uh, I don't know, something wrong with the item or whatever that, that you feel isn't actually wrong with the item. Maybe they've received it and it's not actually working or they claim it's not working and you obviously had tested it two or three days before uh, once you'd sent it out and, and it was working fine. So obviously what you can do in this certain situation is you can still stand your ground. You can make it clear that obviously um, you did test the item or you can make it clear that they won't be getting a partial refund, but they're quite. You're quite happy to accept a return because obviously, as business sellers, we all have to accept returns. But what a lot of people may do, well, not a lot of people, but what certain customers may do, uh, and you'll find this every now and then, is they will do what's known as fishing for a partial refund, which is essentially they will claim there's something wrong with the item or, or something like that, and they will constantly, um, obviously, message you saying about um, could I have a partial refund on this item, something's not working, etc. And they won't want to necessarily return the item, but they'll want this partial refund. Well, essentially you can just stand your ground and you can say, look, sorry, I'll, I'm quite happy to accept a refund, uh, uh, sorry, a return, and then I will give you a full refund, but unfortunately I won't be giving you a partial refund. Just stand your ground on that. You don't need to give them a partial refund, but you do obviously need to accept a return if they would like to return it. But essentially, if you do that, then they may, if they are just fishing for a partial refund, there isn't actually anything wrong with the item, they're just being, they're just trying to get some money off, then obviously they will end up leaving you, they won't message you again. Or if they are genuine and they there is a problem with the item, then they're going to accept the return and then you are going to get the item back and then they can get their money back ultimately. And obviously, um, that you know that sort of wheedles out the people who are maybe being a little bit false, the the buyers who are maybe messaging you and not necessarily scamming you because that's a little bit too much of a strong word for this situation, but are just trying to get a little bit of money off or being a little bit cheeky and trying to trick the system a little bit. Um, so essentially, that's something you can do. You can make sure that you're stand in your ground but at the same time make sure you are being professional don't use profanity or anything like that and obviously when a buyer opens a case against you if they've been aggressive in messages maybe they are using profanity or bad language then ebay are going to take that into account and if you've been professional and courteous even through uh, when they've been aggressive then obviously ebay may side with you just for that fact because 
um, obviously you, you're not allowed to use profanity in eBay messages so eBay may side with you just on that fact alone so it always does pay to be professional and courteous with your messages so I'll leave it at that guys I hope you did enjoy today's class if you did please do leave it a positive review down below if this class wasn't quite what you thought or it, it wasn't particularly for you then maybe a different class you would enjoy more so please go over to my profile I've got generally loads of different classes on there I've got how to increase your eBay views, how to increase your eBay sales, I've got packaging videos on eBay, I've got how to do an FBA shipment, I've got how to list an, e uh, how to list an item on eBay. So I've got loads of different selection to choose from, so maybe another one of my courses would suit you more. And I will leave it there and I will thank you very much and I'll see you in the next one.